This is Julia Whitup with Talk Story TV, and we have with us today traveling shaman Richard Hartnett, and he will be talking about shamanism. <laughs> Welcome, Richard. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. God, I haven't seen you in a long time. I How know. Have you been? <laughs> <laughs> and it's so good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit of an inside joke. We just had an, a conversation earlier today. So uh, any rate, so let's talk about shamanism. Um, my, my title for my ministerial degree is actually, um, I'm, a, I'm a, a mentor um, with an organization called the Prosperos, uh, which I got involved with back in the uh, 70s. Um, but along the way, I've also studied with uh, some Native American folks uh, on uh, Native American spirituality. So uh, the word shaman is not uh, something unfamiliar to me, but I'd like to talk about it in a larger context. Um, you know, when I was working on a, uh, my new tarot deck called the Evolutionary Tarot, and one of the things that I noticed was that a lot of people had some really serious issues with the Hierophant card. Um, it, was, it was a negative card for some people. Some people just hated that card. And I know it was because they had some bad experiences in the religion of their youth. And so they sort of had an association between the imagery on that card and their bad experience. Mm -hmm. Well, anything, you know, whether it's uh, being a magician or being an emperor or being a, a warrior like the chariot, any, any energy can be misused. Um, but ultimately, an archetype of which the Hierophant is, uh, and I'll talk about what archetypes are in a minute, um, is, is useful to us and valuable to us because it is a universal concept. But because people were having issues with the, with the word or, or with the visual imagery of the hierophant and actually the word as well, people don't, what is a hierophant, for instance? Um, I considered actually changing the name of that card to the shaman because I think that a priest, a minister, uh, or a shaman are all performing the same function, which is they are an intermediary between the spiritual realm and the physical realm. And that because they have spent their life, as I have spent my life, thinking about and exploring how to connect with the spiritual realm, um, they are literally um, someone who stands at the door between uh, the two realms. And that they are useful to people because not everybody has the time or the inclination to do that kind of exploration. Some people, uh, when they have a moral dilemma, like to be able to have someone to go to, to talk to, to help them to get clear about how to deal with some sort of moral challenge in their life. So there's definitely a function that a hierophant performs for society. Um, you know, shaman is most often associated with either Native American spirituality or um, Hawaiian uh, spirituality or even, um, what do I want to say, um, uh, Central or South American spirituality or even African spirituality. So there are many different cultures that have something that looks like or is essentially a shamanic in nature. And if you think back um, to maybe some of the movies of your youth, one of the things that you see is that um, uh, oftentimes people are really caught up in the passions of some sort of conflict in the world and they want to immediately go to war uh, and try to, you know, um, hurt their enemy. And the, the shaman is very often the voice of reason that sort of says, Let, let's see if we can find another way to resolve our differences. And that is part of what a shaman does is he, he tries to help us to figure out how to deal with the various challenges in our lives. Um, so that's, that's to me is, is what a shaman is, a shaman is about. And even though I don't call myself that, I think that's the essential function of what I do. And so I don't have any problem calling myself uh, a traveling shaman. Um, I 
as I said earlier, I did study for four years with uh, some uh, Native American teachers, a White Mountain Apache medicine woman and a Yaqui medicine woman. <laughs> and um, the, my, my greatest passion from that experience was my passion for the pipe. Uh, the Native American pipe, and I actually still have a pipe. I'm I am a acknowledged by them to be a pipe carrier, and I do use pipe in a ritual fashion with people. Um, I have used it for blessings for a baby, and I have used it for uh, ceremony uh, in the sense of like a wedding ceremony or something. But also sometimes uh, to help people get into a sacred state of mind to get into a uh, state of mind that's less uh, run by the ego. So I think shamans are, again, are really good at helping to connect with the spiritual world and to bring our, our obsessions with the physical world into balance. Yes. Well, the reason I chose that word, it's a, it's a Mongolian word, of course. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? Yes. It's from the Mongolian language, but it seems to be a word that fits, you know, like medicine man didn't quite make it because it says man and, right. and it can be a woman. Many oh. shamans are women. Uh, yeah. In fact, I think the actually it should be medicine woman, not medicine man, because more often than not, the women were the carriers of the sacred knowledge of healing. Um, in the, um, there are, are um, I'll get back to what an archetype is in just a second, but um, no, actually, let me take a minute to talk about archetypes and then I want to talk about shamans. Um, okay, archetypes. Carl Jung came up with this idea, and that was that if you go around and you study all of the different cultures all over the world, although people have different languages and they have different cultural values, um, there are certain characteristics or qualities or attributes that seem to be universal. For instance, all cultures have leaders. Uh, now, they may call them potentates or presidents or dictators or chiefs or kings or things of that sort. You know, there's all sorts of different words for that, but every culture essentially has um, an archetype for leader, even a, a culture that might be chaotic uh, and is... Uh, and, the beliefs in anarchy, in other words, there are no leaders, there's still a reaction to the archetype of leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, all cultures have mothers, all cultures have uh, medicine people. Um, now, there are, are primarily four archetypes that are very important for men, for, 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 and they are the king, which is the leader uh, role, uh, the warrior, which is, um, you know, every culture has to have some sort of warrior energy to protect itself. Uh, and then there's also the lover, uh, the masculine side of the lover. There's also, of course, the feminine side of the lover. Um, and then there's also uh, the magician, which, um, you know, many times the medicine people uh, that would do ritual uh, we're, we're doing the, the, the magician energy now. So, um, when I was looking at the tarot, I could easily identify those arc four archetypes as the emperor card for the King. The lover card was obviously the lovers. Uh, the warrior card to me is a chariot card. Uh, mm -hmm. and then there's also finally the magician card. So then I looked at the feminine archetypes and I was aware of, through the teachings of Starhawk and other female authors, that there were primarily three uh, feminine archetypes that were talked about. I actually think there's four, but because of the nature of our society, only three are, are primarily talked about, and that's the maiden, the mother, and the crone. And um, the maiden, I think, is easy to see in the Tarot as the high priestess, the mother is the empress card, but where was the crone energy? Uh, and to me, uh, we do the crone energy a disservice if we identify it too much with the witch or the old woman with the, the bent nose and the, and the uh, mole on her face or whatever, because I think the crone energy actually represents feminine 
medicine woman kind of energy. And a young woman can do that as well as an older woman. But it's when um, the feminine energy is receptive to nature and gets a sense of what herbs might be helpful for what kind of things. I mean, how do we come up with medicine? Uh, I mean, it's nothing short of miraculous. Uh, <laughs> it's more than trial and error. I think it's actually women using their intuition, of which women are usually a little bit more comfortable with working with their intuition than men are, using their intuition to, to um, learn from nature, to get a sense of what might work and or what might be poisonous. Um, or even a little, how a little bit of poison can be a cure. <coughs> so, so I was looking at that and thinking, well, there's not really a crone energy in the tarot. And that's led me to one of my additional cards that I've added into my tarot deck, which is uh, I'm calling the healer um, so that we don't get too stuck in that, that crone Im in imagery, but it's very much a feminine archetype. Um, so, Archetypes are universal, and I think that it's really important that we recognize them and that we recognize how important uh, crone energy is or how important healing energy is to us. What about the uh, um, no, I'm sorry, my mind just went blank. I'm thinking of the the uh, sirens, they're sort of a... Um, you mean like in Greek mythology when, when Ulysses is uh, um, sailing across? Right. And, he, and, he, and he, he knows that the sirens will seduce the men to, to wreck their ships on the rocks? Right. Because of their call. Okay, I just want to make sure we're talking about the right same imagery. Um. Although that's a very interesting thing to talk about, um, because on the surface, we might want to identify the sirens as being a negative force because the ships get wrecked on the rocks. Um, so what, what's the truth in this story? Where's the, where is the uh, wisdom in the story? <clears throat> well, here's the truth. We all want to protect ourselves. We all want to protect our ego. So how do we actually, how does spirit challenge us in such a way or draw us out of our isolation, draw us out of our tendency to withdraw from society because, because the world is a dangerous place? Like obviously wrecking your ships on the rocks is a dangerous thing. So what, what spirit does is it has sirens and everybody, both men and women have the ability to be siren like in the sense of calling out, uh, you know, with this magical or this uh, seductive mm -hmm. singing or voice, or something, just something speaks to us. And we are drawn to that energy. And remembering that most myth is metaphor, to, to, to wreck our ships on the rocks is to have our life be totally disrupted by, because of meeting someone that we fall in love with. And, you know, that doesn't have to necessarily just be a woman. And... Um, it can no be a drug. <laughs> Would you say? It can be a drug. A oh, drug. Yeah, it could be a drug. Alcohol. Alcohol. It can absolutely. Yes. Um, there are many different addictions that draw us out of our isolation. Um, so um, the thing is, if we didn't have those things that we may not like them because we go through painful experiences, then we never get to evolve. <clears throat> uh, you know, one of the most common things people come to you for um, as a tarot reader is they ask about relationships. And, and it's almost invariable that people are struggling in relationship, whether it's they are trying to find a relationship or in the courtship phase or they're 
maybe they've been married for a while and they're, you know, they're getting bored with their, each other or there's friction within the relationship. But all of those in different ways indicate that the siren of relationship, the, the, the irresistible call uh, is drawing us out of isolation and into relationships so that we can interact uh, with something outside of our comfort zone. And then when that happens, there's this possibility of evolving and growing uh, through that interaction. I like to say that relationships are evolutionary drivers. So uh, sexual fulfillment, love, friendship, companionship, intellectual stimulation, uh, anything you can, spiritual companionship, anything you can think of that comes to us through the process of relationship, um, you know, that's the reward that you get for doing the hard work. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be in romantic, but that's, the one, of course, the one that's the most seductive. And that's, I think, where the sirens are. The sirens represent that really powerful, alluring energy that says, ooh, you know, you're going to get this fulfillment if you um, listen to the siren's call. Um, but invariably, you will wreck your ship, the ship of your life on the rocks. The old life will be broken down so that a new life might emerge. Now, I'm a big advocate of Greek mythology for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's less threatening to people than when I talk about Christian mythology. When I say Christian mythology, some the, the, the fundamentalists are insulted that I'm calling it myth. Um, but that to me, that's the highest compliment I can give something is to say this is a mythological story because that means it holds a great universal truth like the archetypes. Uh, or the people that are not Christian are offended because I'm talking about the wisdom that's in Christianity. And they're like, you know, they just like being pissed off about, you know, Christianity because maybe they got hurt when they were a kid or something, uh, abuse of power or whatever. Um, but when, um, when I'm a big, I've written two books on Greek mythology. One's called the, uh, the Call of the Soul, which is that a little bit like the sirens is something that calls us out of ourselves. And the other one is called the New Old Gods, which is looking at Greek mythology and finding out, uh, interpreting the stories so that they become relevant for modern society. Um, and in that first book, The New Old Gods, I wrote about the Medusa. And the reason I wanted to talk about that is because the Medusa energy, uh, the Medusa story is sort of another variation on that whole thing about the sirens. Only in the Medusa story, it's not the sirens that are seductive. It's Neptune, the god Neptune. Medusa is this woman who's on her way to honor Athena at Athena's temple. And as she's walking up the steps of the temple, Neptune steps out of the shadows and says, ooh, you know, you're a very attractive woman. And I, you know, I would like to, well, you know, he wants, <laughs> right? And she's like, oh my gosh, can you believe this? A god wants me. And so she is totally seduced by Neptune and she gives herself to him. Well, guess what happens? Athena becomes aware of the fact that this has happened on the steps of her temple. And because she gets mad about it, she turns this woman into the Gorgon, which is the, the creature with the snakes and the hair. And if you look at right. it, so, right? But the only, so notice that both with the sirens and with Neptune, there is a seduction that's going on that essentially disrail, derails life. But if you really look at the stories, what you find is that they don't just tell you what the problem is. They also tell you how to solve the problem. Um, the Medusa story is rather lengthy. Uh, there's a lot of things that happens, but essentially at the end of the story, uh, Perseus, a Greek hero who's half mortal and half God, which is a great metaphor for us because we are half mortal and half spiritual, you know, mm -hmm. uh, he essentially defeats the uh, Gorgon uh, and he does this and the, the metaphors are just amazing. You know, he can't look at it directly. So he holds up the shield and he looks at the reflection, right? Uh -huh. What a great metaphor that is for us because 
you know, when we're caught in a problem in our life, something that has caused us to cast, to wreck our ships on the rocks, uh, or it has caused us to, you know, be seduced by something like Neptune also rules drugs and alcohol, which is, like you said, you know, that's a different form of, I mean, that's a variation on the seduction idea, that when we get seduced uh, and our ship is wrecked, um, there needs to be a way out. And the story of what Perseus does tells us, you know, okay, okay you can't look at it directly because it will turn you to stone. When you're caught up in being hypnotized by something, when you're caught up in an addiction, it does turn you to stone. Mm -hmm. So you have to reflect on it. Did you uh -huh. get that? Uh -huh. <laughs> That's true. Uh -huh. Right? And the reflection is, is doing like psychotherapy or uh, analysis or, or something of that sort. Um, and really beginning to look at your story from a higher perspective so that you can literally chop off the head of the thing that paralyzes you. And it is possible to do that. That work is possible, but it's not, it's not easy work. It's hard work to do the spiritual work. But here's the thing, you know, easy stuff is not really going to, it's unlikely that an easy solution, uh, an easy fix is really going to change anything of any substance. If you have a deep-seated neurosis or a deep-seated wound, then you have to go deep within your psyche in order to heal that. You have to you have to go in the underworld. The Greeks have all these stories about going into the underworld in order to reclaim what has been lost. So, um, you know that's a that's a powerful thing is learning that you can and this is and what do shamans do they are they are they sit between the worlds and, and they go they, into the underworld yes they access both the underworld and the above world they they help us to get a sense of that spiritual is a dynamic presence in our lives and helps us to work with that energy but they also help us to go into the underworld, like if you've ever done sweat lodge, which I studied that for a few years, and I don't conduct sweats, but I'm an advocate of them, but I'm talking about a real sweat, not you know, sitting in a, a sweat with somebody who doesn't really know what it's about, and just because you got hot rocks and, and heat and water and steam and stuff, that's not a sweat lodge. A sweat lodge is a very involved thing. But if you really do one of those, it's painful in a sense. I mean, it's your stuff comes up, your 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 issues come up. Your sometimes we have physical difficulties, which are symptomatic of a deeper malaise that's going on within us. But that's the idea. If you travel to the underworld by doing a sweat lodge to confront your wounds, to confront your erroneous states of consciousness, in order to actually transform yourself. You get what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I've uh, had a lot of experience with sweat lodges. I'm sure you do. <laughs> I would think. And you yeah. probably have a lot of people who are um, coming through your, your organization or uh, are coming and teaching with, for you in Grand Junction um, that have experience about that. And, you know, here's the thing that's really important, and that is that if you're really committed to your path, if you really want to become enlightened, and um, I want to talk about enlightenment in a minute, but if you really want to become enlightened, then I think it's important for you to, to meet teachers. Now, you don't want to be a dilettante where you move from one thing to the next without ever really committing yourself to doing the work, because I see a lot of that in the new age. People flit from, like, crystals to tarot cards to astrology to this and that and they never really do any kind of substantial work any of those tools can take you deep but ultimately the only person that is able to take you deep is yourself now a shaman can act as a guide but you have to set foot on that path you have to engage the shaman to help you uh, to guide you as you as you walk into the underworld but ultimately it's your journey 
and ultimately it's up to you to decide whether to do it or not. And could you talk to us a little about ritual and ceremony and the function of those things? Sure. Um, well, I was raised Catholic and I was an altar boy, and that means I got up to be on I got to be up on the stage where all the stuff was happening, you know. Yeah. Um, I got to watch the you know the water and the wine and and move the book around and ring the bells and you know it was there was a lot of different things that were going on. So it wasn't boring. <laughs> when you're, a kid, you're, a, you're a Catholic mass, it's incredibly boring, particularly when I was a kid, because it was all in Latin. You know, so I always love that because it, it seemed it mysterious. It made it mystical. Yeah. That's the valuable side of it. And people were like, well, we're bored because Here's the reason they were bored. They lost their sense of what the ritual was about. It could have been in Latin if they had taken the time to really explain more to people about what was going on in the ritual. Now, ritual is, is something that helps us to get into a state of mind. Uh, ritual and ceremony is a way of, uh, it's like a courtship. You're, you're, or a cultivation. It's like you're prepping yourself um, for what it is that's about to take place. Um, you know, like a common ritual we do in America is people may not say grace on a daily basis, but when Thanksgiving comes around, more often than not, people will take the time to give thanks, to do some sort of saying of grace, but and that is a ritual of honoring the blessing of the food that comes our way on a daily basis that sustains our life. So ritual is a way of in, evoking or bringing forth a state of consciousness. Um, and I also think that part of wh why ritual is valuable, like for instance, as I said, I'm a pipe carrier and I, and I smoke the pipe with people, is I think that doing some sort of physical gesture helps people to accept a different state of consciousness. Uh, it helps, it helps to get into that state of consciousness, or in some cases it might even be an excuse for getting into that state of consciousness because otherwise people might, you know, not take it too seriously. Um, you know, I think it's unfortunate that uh, as a society, we have this tendency to not do meals like Thanksgiving, to not sit around in conversation, that um, we have been seduced by cell phones uh, and computers and television, and that <clears throat> you, you, I see this uh, even in my own home where um, – I, you know, there's a teenager that lives in my house, not mine, but somebody else's. Uh, it's a long story. Um, but at any rate, we'll do a meal together, and she's like this. You know, she's got the cell phone right here, and she's doing this. Instead of interacting with the adults in the room and, and, and benefiting from that interaction, she is just doing that thing. So the ritualistic aspect of a meal the nurturing aspect of family is lost mm -hmm. because of our, our technological stuff. And it, I think you could easily say that we have become addicted to cell phones. Um, when you really look at what addiction is, and one of the characteristics of addiction is that you can never get enough of whatever it is you're addicted to. Um, like if it's alcohol or it's drugs, you always want more. You always want greater. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is that most often when we're addicted, um, we don't get it. We think that if we could just get that one extra drink or that, you know, if I could just hit the big jackpot when I'm gambling or if I can have a really good conversation on my cell phone or something that that somehow is going to fulfill me and that I'm going to have something um, 
that is going to make me happy, but it never works. It's what it's what I call flipping the light switch to turn down the stereo. <laughs> no, no matter how many times you do it, it isn't going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah. Well, um, I really like ceremony because it puts you in an altered frame of mind. Yes, exactly. And to me, that leads to enlightenment. Oh, let's talk about enlightenment for a minute. Okay. Before I say anything, I want to hear what you think enlightenment is. Enlightenment, I think of it as, I guess, basically when you're able to drag something up out of the unconscious into the conscious. Right. Or into the light. Right, into the light. Um, and I, I would say that when you say drag it up out of the unconscious, it might be good to say that you're dragging it out of the collective unconscious. I, I thought of that right after I said that. Rather than the personal, mm -hmm. because in our personal unconscious, we have all of our personal memories, thoughts, attitudes, and very often, you know, that's the part of ourselves that is, limits our perception of the world. But out beyond that personal unconscious, is the collective where all the wisdom, knowledge uh, of the universe exists. <clears throat> you might say it's the spiritual realm, because it is sort of the spirit. It is a spiritual realm. It, you know, like if a scientist were to invent <clears throat> all the light bulb, let's say, all of the laws and principles that go into making a light bulb existed well before Thomas Edison put them together and made them into an expression that we call the light bulb. Um, enlightenment is the same idea. <clears throat> As you're putting together truth, you're putting together various truths into um, a new way of seeing things. In a sense, what you've done is <clears throat> you're working with a limited state of mind and through uh, doing some sort of spiritual work, I think what happens is um, you've broken down the limits of your old thinking and your consciousness literally does this thing where it goes, boop, it gets, it pops, it gets it, big. Yeah. As you're seeing something that you didn't see before. And, and, and think of the word enlightenment. It's like you have entered into the light. When you're in the light, you see things clearly. And when you see things clearly, you're able to live in harmony with them. So your world has literally expanded as long as you hold on to the, the insight or the revelation. Um, and then I think it's important to get that enlightenment is something that happens not just once, but many, many times in life. That one, one doesn't become enlightened one has very <laughs> of enlightenment. Now, some people we might say, "Well, this guy's really amazing teacher. He's very enlightened." Well, he may have a higher level of understanding than you do, but it doesn't mean that he isn't doing his work. I had a really great teacher that I I I've not met anybody as brilliant in, in my life as he was, um, and I got to spend some up close and personal time with him. Uh, and I would notice that he was still struggling with certain thoughts, attitudes, beliefs. He was struggling with his own limits, but he was always pushing up against his limits, trying to become something more than what he was. Uh, and I get that. I mean, I have a hard time today uh, letting myself relax and, and, and doing something that just for fun of it. I mean, I, I have a tendency to think, I, I got to do the work, you know, I want to, I want to be of service. I got to become more enlightened. So I noticed that I don't really do as much relaxation as I should. And I'm trying to figure out how to get that more into balance. Some, something that works for me is, uh, you know, television or movies sometimes will work, but I've gotten to the point where that's become sort of boring because there's, there's not that many new ideas. So I'm like looking around for something that feeds my, my need for relaxation without necessarily being boring. So, well, you know what I've been doing is um, cannabis. Okay. And I believe that used correctly, 
as more of a sacrament and paying attention to dose set and setting you can have a lot you can have fun and you can also have periods of enlightened meditation just because you're at a higher frame of mind it actually getting high actually makes you at a higher frame of mind if you don't do too much yeah i agree i um when i was young i grew up in a small town and our entertainment was to drink uh, i started drinking when i was 13 <clears throat> and i probably got drunk for the first time when i was about 14 um and i drank a lot uh, up till i was 18 and when i was 18 a friend of mine turned me on to some pot and that was so much more interesting than alcohol <laughs> Yeah. And so, yeah, I've always uh, had that as something that I've used um, a little bit like what you're describing. And it does help me to relax. Um, and yeah, I, I could definitely see what you're saying. And I think that it, it can be useful. But the tricky thing today, of course, is this damn stuff is so freaking strong. Yeah, it's hard to not do too much. I'm yeah. It's, yeah. I'm finding out ways to control the dose like they have sodas that are infused and it's it, because it's liquid it's very easy to measure it so you can control your dose. Oh and okay. You can kind of dial it in to where you get the exact result you want. More is not I, always better. I suppose that would be true also for like the candy or the cookies. Yeah, they're a little harder to measure, though, whereas liquid's, yeah. like, really easy to measure. I have I a little measuring shot glass, and I can adjust the, measure, the dose up and down and get it just right. Well, that makes sense to me. I tried um, uh, some edibles, and I got really sick. <laughs> <laughs> you did too much. <laughs> yeah, and that was not a fun experience, so. But maybe, you know, with the liquid stuff. And you also got to be patient with uh, edibles or, or liquid because it takes a while before you to notice it as opposed to when you smoke, you notice it a lot quicker. It's a different experience, though. Tell, um, tell me more about teacher plants and your work with teacher plants. Or, or have you done that? Are you talking like mescaline and peyote? Yes. Or white waracas. I can never say that word. Waracas. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't say it. I lost. Uh, I haven't done that one, although I, I had a, a friend who had some good experience with that. Um, I did do peyote and I did do uh, mescaline when I was younger. Um, the thing that was very interesting for me about that was that I think that when you do psychedelics, which mescaline, peyote, wurikasa, acid are all psychedelics, that it's, it's a different kind of experience than say smoking or eating or doing some sort of THC product. Uh, it's a different kind of experience because I think it's, I feel like you're more lucid but reality, your the world seems to really become very fluid, very malleable, and you start things start wavering or moving or stuff, and that there's all sorts of, you know, you st literally it's like you're in a dream and you're seeing archetypes or you're seeing stuff. So I think that I think they are very helpful to get people to recognize that the their experience is not as absolute as they like to think it is. That very much it helps us to recognize that our consciousness is, very, is like a filter that mm -hmm. filters the absolute and that what we're looking at is a movie which is a projection of our unconscious and it's sort of revealing to us you know, where we are at on our spiritual journey. So I think those it's really useful. And one time uh, I remember that I had gotten uh, particularly high on some sort of psychedelic plant 
and the world started to feel like it was dissolving and that my spiritual tools were, were, were able to help me to keep from feeling like I was going crazy, uh, that it was, became like an anchor that helped me to get through that. So I think that <clears throat> they're very, very valuable um, in breaking down the absolute uh, iron grip that the unconscious has on, on the conscious mind. But I, I feel like, like anything, you know, once you get the message, then I think it's, you know, you've got the messages. I don't know that it's necessarily continues to serve and then it can become, you know, an addiction like anything else. It, it, um, I, I think that's less likely with THC or marijuana or products because I think that there's also this big medicinal quality that's going on. I know you have some physical challenges mm -hmm. that I know that probably the, the products that you're using are helping you to manage some of your yes. physical difficulties. Yes, it is. But I, I think it's like we talked about enlightenment earlier too. If you're using it for that purpose and using the correct dose, you will have periods of enlightenment every time because you set up a little ritual with it. You know you've worked out your dose and your mind will just automatically go where it needs to go for that. Yeah, <clears throat> but again, I think it's essential that you have a sense of ritual like we were talking about yes. earlier that it like with sweat lodge if you don't have the appropriate sense of the ritual of sweat lodge and you just sort of subject yourself to the hot uh steam or whatever that's not necessarily going to make that experience happen and that with psychedelics or you know it's the same kind of thing if you if you don't approach it in a rit rit ritualistic way then it's possible that that could become a you know a distraction and or an addiction yeah yes or if you're doing it too much or too much or too often yeah exactly um we talked a little about ego earlier and i i wonder if we should go back to that a little bit you mean you and i personally talked about this yes before yes. we started this show yes before we started the show so yeah so that's really a, a really helpful I think that's an important concept to talk about. There's a lot of what I call ego bashing going on in society today. And I hear sometimes people say things like they wish that they're striving to become ego less. And I think that's a mistake. Like any other part of our, of our consciousness, uh, the ego has a purpose, just as the body may ha has a purpose, just as the mind has a purpose, um, and just as the soul has a purpose. And that our challenge as conscious people on the path is to understand what the appropriate use of the ego is. To say to become egoless to me is a pointless thing to say because it's like saying, I want to cease to exist. Because the ego is literally our identity in this world. But it's paradoxical because it's also a transitory thing. Uh, you know, who you are today is not who you were when you were a child, even though there are elements that run through the, that have, you know, that you, you can recall being that person. You are not that person anymore. You, you are who you are today. So this ego is a, sort of this malleable thing that is constantly changing, but also there's something about it that seems to be consistent. Um, so... To, to, if you didn't have an ego, you wouldn't have uh, a vessel in which to uh, do your work in this world. And I do think that when we die, we drop the ego. But there's a, something else within us, which I think is the soul or our essence, that sort of observes the ego. And without, you know, without saying it's um, that there's sort of an objective relationship the soul has with the ego where it just goes, it notices. And it notices when the ego is running the show and it's out of control and everything is about feeding the ego, you know, gratifying its desires, gratifying its needs, making doing something to make itself feel better. 
um, the, you know, that, that can become a problem when you get on an ego trip, if you will. Yeah. When the ego totally. Um, everything is about gratification and it's also everything is about the self and what is lost is a sense of the inner dynamic between the self and others or the self and the world that it's all about what the self wants and feeding the self <clears throat> and that's when we engage in exploitation now i think as when you look at our society today what you see is there's a lot of unethical behavior going on <clears throat> There's a lot of people engaging in ruthlessness and lying and stealing and murder and all sorts of other horrible, depraved things. That's because they have nothing other than ego. They don't recognize the soul within themselves. They don't identify the soul within themselves. And that's part of our job as shamans is to, re is to reacquaint people with their soul and to take the soul out of the limited context of religion and, and bring it into a larger arena of awareness so that people can have a sense of the soul is their friend or it is who they are and that it is valuable to them. And that there is a really interesting dynamic between the ego and the soul. Um, I, one of my books that I wrote is called The Call of the Soul. And what I talk about in this book is that the soul is the place within ourselves in which we hear spirit saying, you know, Richard, this is what you should do. Or Julia, you know, this is where you should go or try this or do that. And sometimes it speaks to us through intuition. Sometimes it speaks to us in meditation. Sometimes it speaks to us through a moment of enlightenment. But that soul, you know, comes up with something and it says, okay, ego, now let's, let's work together, right? Mm -hmm. When I do a talk, you know, I very much do it because my ego likes doing it. I like being effective. I like, you know, being able to be articulate. My ego enjoys that. But it isn't about feeding my ego at the expense of others or feeding my ego exclusively because to make it feel good. It's more like my ego, when my ego is aligned with my soul's intention, then it's a win-win. Both parts of me are moving in the same direction. And I also think that it's a way of aligning yourself with the evolutionary intention. Um, it's, I think the entire history of the universe is about the evolution of consciousness. And, um, you know, I could, I could talk a whole, I could talk an hour just about that idea of the connection between evolution and consciousness and spirit, but back to the ego. Um, when the ego becomes aware of that, there's something greater than itself of which it can become a part, uh, then that gives the ego its place in the world. It gives us a sense of purpose and meaning, and it gives us a sense of gratification. If we are a society that is struggling with addiction, it's because there's something within us that's hungry. Yes. And we, and we, and we don't identify what that hunger is. And I think the hunger is to have a sense of purpose other than self-gratification. And that and, connection with the greater. Yes, with the greater force of evolution, the greater spirit's intention. And that when you are working with that, you get a sense of happiness, a sense of peace that you can't get through all of the different things you do to feed the ego. Right. But the ego does feel good when it's doing that kind of thing. It feels like it's part of something greater than itself. Uh, and that's a really important thing. You know, I, I puzzle over why people are able to actually run into combat uh, and put their lives in danger. And it's because somewhere within them, they're hungry to be feel like they are part of something greater than just themselves. And, and that's what allows themselves to put themselves at risk. Um, there's a really interesting series on TV right now about the Vietnam War. It's very well done. Yeah, I've been watching that. Uh, and one of the things that you get is how many people volunteered or, or enrolled to become part of that, to, and they felt like they were serving a greater good. And somewhere along the line, that got lost. And when they become aware of the fact that that got lost, there's a tremendous sense of anger. 
and a tremendous sense of betrayal within these people. They're so deeply wounded because they went through such incredible suffering um, in an effort to serve something greater than themselves and to realize that they'd been betrayed by a lack of consciousness on the part of their leaders or some outright, you know, self-serving on the part of their leaders. Uh, you know, the, the amount of rage is, yes. is really huge. Unfortunately, too many people turn the rage against themselves. I was stupid to do this and they, and they hate themselves and that leads to suicide. You know, there was more suicides I, than there were deaths. Yeah, there's been more suicides of Vietnam vets than actual people that were killed in Vietnam. I know that's incredible. Yeah. That shows the amount, the incredible price that they paid. Yeah, a, an incredible woundedness and an incredible betrayal on the part of um, our leaders. You know, and and I think it's larger than just American politicians. I think it's literally we are at a crisis point in our evolution as a race. And the, the crisis point is not, you know, will capitalism survive? Will communism prevail? That's an oversimplification of two extremes, if you will. You could say communism or socialism and capitalism. Um, it's something greater than that is will we rise above our egotism that wants to get into a fist fight to, to make ourselves right and instead find the courage within ourselves to peacefully negotiate an enlightened resolution to the challenges and conflicts that we have. Uh, and that's what I'm calling on shamans to do here. That's what yeah. I really want. That is the great work. That, that is, is the work we all must do. And I think we need to wrap this up now. So, um, I've been talking for an hour. I, God, it's easy for me to do that. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but um, you can uh, see more about Richard on our website at shamanicarts.studio. And do you have a website, Richard? Yes, if I may, I want to share with you my website, which is www.quantumspirit1.com. Quantum or, Spirit One? Yes. Number one? Uh, the word, O-N-E. Okay. So there's that website. I also have a Facebook page where I do a daily tarot card every day and a little lesson associated with that card. And I also want to mention that I have about six or eight lectures up on YouTube, and those are totally free. Uh, so if you put in my name, Richard Hartnett, on, my, uh, on YouTube, you'll see my little shining face sitting in my blue vest with my white shirt, uh, and you can find six or eight different lectures. I did one on creation myth. I did one on, oh, this is really interesting one that people would find interesting is Zombies. I did a, a lecture on zombies. What's the significance of why zombies are in the collective consciousness right now? I also did one on vampires. Uh, and there's a couple other things in there. So that might be something people might enjoy. Okay. And we are looking forward to your coming to Grand Junction to meet with us. Yes. And... Um, so thank you for being with us, and I will be uploading this to YouTube. Anyone who wants to subscribe to my channel, it's youtube.com slash Julia Widdop, W-I-D-D-O-P. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, dear. Thank you. For